Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our virtual chat chat program. We're back after a short summer break, and we're very excited to start with an interesting and useful topic for all of us. But first of all, I want to introduce our speaker today, psychology professor and Fulbright scholar who specializes in positive psychology and education, Lori Wolf. Hi, Lori. Hi, Gulshan. How are you? Good. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Of course, I'm always happy to. Unfortunately, I'm not there in person because it would be nice to actually be back in Tashkent, but I'm happy to be able to do this online for you. Thank you. And I'm going to uh, introduce you to people and tell a little bit about you so that people mm -hmm. know you. I know most of many people know you in Uzbekistan, um, <laughs> but for those who don't, um, Professor Wolf completed her graduate work in school psychology at Syracuse University in New York, USA. Mm -hmm. She has taught um, at um, Casanova College in New York, um, Raritan Valley Community College in New Jersey, and um, currently teaches at Anoka Ramsey Community College in Minnesota. Professor Wolf spent the spring 2019 semester living and working in Tashkent, Uzbekistan as Fulbright Scholar. She worked with the Minister of Public Education to design a bullying prevention and stress reduction program for students. So this gives me a great pleasure uh, to not only welcome her, but I would like to thank her again for speaking with us today and for being a part of um, other ACT programming such as debate clubs. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, of course. I'm so happy yeah. to be here. Thank you for inviting me back. Thank you. And I also want to remind everyone, all our viewers, uh, that you're welcome to put your questions in the comment section and we'll be addressing them during and after the talk. Uh, Lori, we're lucky to have you today. Thank you again. And the floor is, floor is yours. All right, well, again, thank you. I am so excited to be able to talk to you and all of the viewers through the ACT. Um, one of the things I enjoyed the most when I was there in Tashkent as a Fulbright Scholar was doing the chai chat in person at the embassy, which was really, was really fun to get to interact with people. Unfortunately, this one's online and it's a little harder to have that interaction, but I do encourage people to type questions as they think of them um, when I'm talking and I'm happy to sort of pause throughout the presentation and take questions as, as we can. And I will save some time at the end too for just an open forum of questions because I really wanna be able to address whatever questions you have about my talk as, as we're going through it. So don't be shy. <laughs> All right, should we bring the presentation up? Sure. All right. So I, as Gulshan said, study positive psychology, and I've been working most recently on applying it to educational settings. But really, um, positive psychology is the study of happiness um, in any setting, just how do we become happier people? Um, so I want to take you through some of the findings of the research in positive psychology about what do happy people do? What makes people happy? And how can we all learn those sort of characteristics, behaviors, um, traits, so that we can be happier in our lives? I think all of us have some room to be happier people. Most of the time, if you ask somebody, hey, would you like to be happier? <laughs> They're not going to say, no, I don't want more of that happiness, right? So positive psychology is the scientific study. So we're trying to use experimental methods to figure out the characteristics and behaviors that make people happier, that enhance their emotional or psychological well-being. And for a long time, the field of psychology was always focused on when things go wrong and talking about mental illness and disorders. And we neglected entirely looking at when things go right and what it's like to be happy, healthy, and well-adjusted. So more recently, psychology has turned to this particular topic and trying to understand happiness, what leads to it, and how we can use that information to make people in general, not just people who are struggling, but all of us, happier, healthier people. Right, so I'm going to present this model. It's 
got a nice abbreviation PERMA and it stands for five different aspects uh, that are related to happiness. So the P stands for positive emotion. The E is engagement. And I'm going to talk about what each one of these are in more detail. I'm just presenting um, what all five of them are right now. So positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and achievement. Right? So these are the five things that people really need in their lives to feel happy, healthy, well-adjusted. Right? So we need to experience positive emotions, things like joy, contentment, peace, happiness. Um, we need to have a sense of engagement, and I'm going to talk about what that is specifically in a few minutes. We need to have positive relationships. Um, people are not meant to be isolated from each other, which is part of why COVID was, has been so hard on people because we need to have those interactions with others. Um, meaning, a sense of purpose in our life and achievements, a sense that we have accomplished things, right? So these are the five keys to leading a happy life. And let me go into each of these in detail here. Um, and if there are questions as I go, again, feel free. Gulshan will be monitoring the comments and popping in whenever there's a relevant question. I'm happy to take that as we go. All right, so let's talk a little about positive emotions. Right? We need to try and find ways to increase our positive emotions, like feelings of peace, contentment, happiness, while also decreasing negative emotions, things like stress, anxiety, sadness, guilt, shame, anger. <laughs> There's a lot of them. Right? And I'm going to talk about three different techniques, and there are many more. This is just a, a quick overview of a few that you could start using right away if you want to. So one is gratitude. The next one I'm going to talk about is mindfulness, and then finally meditation. Right. So all three of these techniques have shown in research to reduce stress, reduce anxiety, reduce depression or sadness, while at the same time increasing feelings of happiness, peacefulness, contentment. So um, the more you can make gratitude and mindfulness specifically part of your everyday approach to life, the just more positive emotions you're going to experience. And then meditation is a little bit more of a thoughtful, strategic practice that you could include here and there throughout your routine. So gratitude, I love this quote. Often we talk about uh, a glass in English. We talk about a glass being half full or half empty. So people see a glass and well, I have a glass <laughs> and it's got a certain amount of water in it, but not all the way to the top. Right? And we talk about optimists seeing the glass as half full and pessimists seeing it as half empty, looking at just the empty part of it. But really what we should be focusing on is the fact that you have a glass <laughs> and there's something in it. Right? This is the practice of gratitude. Right. So the more we can focus on the good things in life, the more positive emotions we're going to experience. So some people are naturally very good at this, and that's fantastic. If you are one of these people, you don't need to work on gratitude. But if it's not something that you think about on a regular basis, it's, it's fairly easy to begin to incorporate a gratitude practice into your approach to life. Just getting up in the morning and thinking of something you have to be grateful for. The sun is shining today um, or it's raining. Like maybe we might be happy. Like in Minnesota right now, we're having a really bad drought. It's hot, it's dry, and we desperately need rain, right? So yesterday it rained for about 20 minutes and then it stopped and got hot again. But still to notice that and be grateful, like, wow, this is wonderful. It's finally raining. Um, whatever it is you have around you, you know, really simple things can impact your everyday life that we just take for granted. You know, the fact that I have food to eat tonight. I have a hot shower. <laughs> um, when I was living in Tashkent, I was shocked to realize that sometimes they turn the water off. <laughs> like, oh, 
my apartment has no water all week. <laughs> so I really learned to be grateful for the fact that I have running water right now. Like, that's a good thing, something that I had taken for granted living in America. So just to begin to notice things in your everyday life and mentally point them out to yourself um, can help increase your um, positive emotions. There's some other simple things that you can do if you would like to start incorporating more of a gratitude practice in your everyday life. Um, one thing is to write a gratitude letter. Um, this is a little bit more involved and thoughtful, but I have my students in my positive psychology course where I teach um, do this assignment every semester, and I have never had a single student say that they regretted doing it. Without fail, everyone says they feel so much happiness, so many positive emotions after writing a gratitude letter. So think of somebody who is important to you, somebody who has done something meaningful in your life something that has helped you in some way, and maybe you haven't properly expressed that to them. Write a letter to that person. And I make my students handwrite it because it has a more personal feel than typing some message on Telegram or, or email, something like that. So handwrite a gratitude letter where you express to the person how much they mean to you, what they've done to support you and be specific about it. Don't just say, hey, thanks for always being there. Like the best gratitude letter has specific examples. Like, hey, when I was struggling, when I was younger and didn't know, you know, what to do with my life, you were there to listen and give me guidance. And I appreciate that, you know, you always listened without judgment, or, you know, whatever it is. You write that letter and then you give it to them. And this can be difficult, but I encourage students to give it to them in person and stay there while they read it. Because what happens is the person reads it and then you see their positive emotions. You see how it impacts them and seeing them gain happiness from reading the letter gives you another boost to happiness. All right, so if that's possible, that's a really nice way to practice gratitude and express it to somebody else. Um, you can also keep a gratitude journal. You can have a piece of paper or a notebook or even just on your phone at night before you go to bed. Think of three things from the day that you're grateful for and write that down in your journal. Um, it can be a nice thing when you're not feeling as happy to go back and reread your gratitude journal and say, oh, that's right. They have all of these good things that have been happening to me. Um, you can also, if you are in a setting, like an educational setting, if you're a teacher or a parent, you can do this at home with your kids. You can use a gratitude jar. So you just have some kind of a vase, a pitcher, a jar, and little slips of paper. And any time during the day, anyone can go up and drop a little note in the jar about what they're grateful for in that moment. And then when everyone needs a little boost, maybe at dinner time, if it's a family, or on Fridays at school in the afternoon, you can pull a few out of the jar and read them and just remind people of all the good things. And then finally, just simply remembering to say thank you for things and even going out of your way to thank people you wouldn't normally thank, like maybe your cleaning person. Maybe you don't say thank you that often to your cleaning person or somebody that you pass on the street who does something nice for you. You know, maybe you drop something and they pick it up and hand it to you. Just simple things, saying thank you during the day. Maybe you have family members that you sometimes take for granted. You know, when was the last time you stopped and thanked your mom for everything she does for you? So simple things like that can all increase gratitude. Or sorry, increase happiness. Uh, next one is mindfulness. Right? So often we spend a lot of our time thinking about the past thinking about the future, trying to plan, being distracted by all of the things you need to do. And your mind feels cluttered. It feels jumbled, a little bit overwhelmed with thoughts. Like in this cartoon, the person that's walking um, has this thought bubble full of all kinds of junk. Right? And that leads to more feelings of stress and anxiety 
versus when you can be fully present in the moment. So this is funny because it's a dog, right? And if you have a dog, you know, they just live in the moment. Um, but they're fully focused on the present moment. So mindfulness is basically a state of being aware of and attentive to whatever it is that's taking place in the present moment without judgment about it. So trying not to say this is good or this is bad or wishing things were different than they were. I wish it wasn't so hot outside. I wish my air conditioning worked better. Um, I wish I was somewhere on a beach in the tropics. Um, not doing that but simply noticing the moment and trying to appreciate it as for whatever it is. Like, you know, I'm sitting here right now and I have a window in front of me. You all can't see that. Um, and there's butterflies. I can see butterflies flying around in the window right in front of me right now. I, if I was really distracted with other thoughts, I might completely miss the butterflies flying around in front of me because I'm worried about, what am I gonna make for dinner tonight? And I have to go to the store and buy these ingredients. And then I also have laundry that's piling up that I have to do and, 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 and your brain just misses the moment because it's focused on everything else. So mindfulness is just this practice of constantly bringing yourself back to the present moment and appreciating what's going on around you right here and now. Right? And one simple way to begin to practice mindfulness is just to stop and notice your breathing. If we were doing this in person, I would take us all through a mindful breathing exercise, um, but it's a little hard to do online. So I'm just going to explain a bit about it and you can do it anytime, anywhere. You simply stop what you're doing. You can close your eyes if that works for you. If not, you can leave your eyes open and you simply bring your full attention into your breath. Just take a few slow, deep breaths and notice it. And that simple action, it can really be just like five breaths, three breaths can be enough to calm your, yourself down and increase your feelings of contentment and decrease your stress. So you can also do it for five minutes, 10 minutes, <laughs> 20 minutes, um, any amount of time that you need to, to, to settle yourself. Um, but that mindful breathing, just noticing your breath is the simplest way to begin um, to practice mindfulness. There's another really nice practice too that some of you might want to do and that's mindful eating. I know how much Uzbeks love their national foods. So next time you have plov or somsa or shashlik, something like that, stop and really fully notice your food. Smell it. Look at it taste it, feel the texture, notice the spices, What? have it be a full experience. It doesn't have to be the entire meal, but you know, take a few bites and just focus on fully experiencing the food and just notice how it changes your emotions in that moment. So that's mindfulness. And then the last thing about positive emotions was meditation. Um, meditation is more of a formal practice of mindfulness. So when we meditate, we are sort of stopping all of the other things we're doing and focusing just on being in the moment. You can notice your breath. You can um, have some kind of like meditative music in the background. You can go outside and listen to birds or whatever sounds there are in nature. But you're, you're purposefully stopping what you're doing and finding a space of quiet. So a lot of people say, I can't meditate because I can't quiet my mind. That's not what it's about. Um, even in meditation, a lot of people find that their thoughts are still racing, but somewhere underneath all of that noise in your mind, there is a space of quiet inside of you. And, and it's a kind of like you have to dive down underneath those waves of thought and find the still water underneath it. That's what you do in meditation. And it might not feel like you're actually achieving anything while you're meditating, and that's okay. Um, even if your thoughts are going a mile a minute during meditation, you can still find benefits of it afterwards. Um, so research on meditation has shown that people who meditate regularly, um, they have uh, lower rates of depression, 
lower anxiety. They have better immune systems, which mean they fight off germs better. They get sick less often. Um, they also have um, increases in memory, learning, and the ability to focus and pay attention to things are all increased through meditation practice. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to finding some time, even just five minutes a day, to sit down and meditate. And there are so many meditations out there. If you don't want to just sit and listen to yourself breathe, you can find a guided meditation. There are tons of them on the internet. Just go to YouTube and search meditation and you'll get thousands of results. Um, okay, so that's positive emotion. The next one is engagement. And again, if people have questions, Gulshan, I'm happy to pause in between each one and take any questions that people have. I'm going to take a drink. Uh, Laura, uh -huh. Laura, we do have a question uh, here mm -hmm. uh, from Dabat Ali. Uh, he's asking if you could share about educational programs that you plan on having, which are available to the secondary school students. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't have any plans at this time to come back to Uzbekistan and do any programming. I would love the opportunity to do more programming on this topic in Uzbekistan. In the United States, um, there are schools that are starting to build this approach into their curriculum. So in addition to teaching math and science and English and those regular topics, there are schools that are starting to also teach this PERMA model and teach students about mindfulness, teach them about gratitude, teach them about the, the next one I'm going to talk about, engagement and meaning. So there, there are schools that are starting to put this into their formal curriculum. Um, but it's not yet like really widely spread in the U.S. either. Um, but yeah, if the embassy is interested in offering something for students in Uzbekistan, I'm always available and happy to come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no more questions so far. People have started yeah. practicing gratitude, saying thanks <laughs> uh, in the comments. And some people are saying that it's a very good uh, and helpful presentation. Oh, oh wonderful. One more question. What do you think about the upcoming ligma epidemic in, Uzbek in Uzbekistan? I'm not familiar with that. What What is this? Because that doesn't sound like COVID. I'm, I'm following COVID. What is ligma? Is there some new epidemic? I haven't heard about it. Oh. Um, maybe we can hear from the person who asked the question. Yeah, you know, maybe they can explain at the end, like we'll save time for question and answers at the end and mm -hmm. we can um, find out what it is they're talking about. Because um, no, I haven't, I haven't heard of this. So you can educate me a little. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No yes. more questions so far. Okay, so let's go back and talk about engagement. So engagement really is about um, finding activities that you enjoy doing to the extent that you get totally absorbed in the moment. So uh, the technical term for this is called flow, right? So finding your flow. Um, this can be really anything, like right? different people find flow in different ways. But the idea of being totally absorbed in an activity, so much so that sort of everything else falls away, you're completely focused, you're completely engaged. You might not even stop to go to the bathroom or eat <laughs> because you're just so focused on what you're doing. Um, and it, it leads to a lot of positive emotions. People who report that they find flow, that flow state more often in their everyday lives, they are happier people. Right? And there are some conditions that help facilitate flow. First of all, you have to be engaged in an activity that is the right level of challenge for you. If something's too easy for you, you won't find flow. You have to be challenged so that you have to use your skills and stretch yourself just a little, but not so much so that it's too difficult for you. 
and then you get frustrated and start to give up. So you need to find things that are like within your skill set, but also stretch you a little and ask you to grow. That, that's when you'll most likely find a state of flow. Um, it also needs to be something that can hold your focus, right? So an activity that you want to accomplish, like that you are interested in, right? So it will hold your focus. It's hard to find flow if you're doing something that you don't enjoy or that, which is actually the next, <laughs> the next uh, button, um, something that you find boring, right? So you need to be challenged, you need to be inherently interested in it and enjoy doing it. And you need to be focused on it. So your environment needs to be free from distractions. So if there's a lot of people around, family members coming in and out, co-workers coming in and out, interrupting you, that will interrupt flow. So a flow state happens most often when you, your environment is free of distractions and you're able to fully focus on the task. Um, and again, like I said, people find flow doing different things and in different ways. So what you need to do is explore different activities uh, to try and figure out where do you find flow? Um, I noticed... I never really thought about flow until I started studying positive psychology. And then I noticed that one of the reasons I think I enjoy teaching so much is I actually do get in a flow state. Like when I am engaging with students in person in a classroom, and I found this to be true in my most recent trip to Uzbekistan, I was just there this past spring. I mean, I was doing some work at the pedagogical university and doing some guest lectures in classes. And I realized that I'll be teaching and all of a sudden it's been an hour. I, it feels like five minutes for me. I get so absorbed in the act of interacting with the students that time just goes by. And I'm like, how did that happen? Like, I didn't even realize it was that long. And people who can figure out where they find flow and then incorporate that into their daily lives, whether it's through your job or through volunteer activities or hobbies, whatever it might be, they report being happier people. So explore different options, figure out where you find flow. And if you're younger and thinking about career choices, are there ways for you to create a career for yourself that allows you to find flow on a regular basis? If so, you'll enjoy your job much more than other people who don't have that. Oh, I forgot there was one more bubble. Goal-oriented. You need to have a goal to accomplish. There should be a purpose to what you're doing, like an end point, right? So I know when I'm teaching, there's always a goal, an objective. I'm going to teach this material. Um, but it can be a variety of things, like you're, it could be painting, you could be creating music. Um, it might be sports for you. You might find flow when you're golfing or playing soccer, well, football <laughs> for non-Americans. Um, so whatever it is, even video gaming. I mean, a lot of younger people find flow when they're video gaming. I know gamers who <laughs> can play for hours upon hours trying to accomplish a task in a game and they don't stop to eat or drink or go to the bathroom. Um, and it's because they're in a flow state. Um, I'm not suggesting you spend all your days playing video games unless you can manage to make a career out of it, but certainly it's also possible to find flow doing that. Okay, and the R in PERMA is relationships. It's really important for us as people to surround ourselves with other positive people. And attitudes are contagious, by the way. So if you're around a lot of people who have negative energy, have seem to have a bad attitude or bring a lot of negativity to the situation, you'll notice yourself sort of also incorporating that into you, your approach um, and your feelings. So the more you can surround yourself with positive people, the more happiness you'll feel. And I'm also going to talk about some characteristics of what makes relationships healthy or makes them positive relationships. So here's a picture in case you're wondering. This is my family. Obviously, I'm <laughs> the, the middle 
in the dress and then my husband is to my left and my son to my right and then my brother was with us on this trip to Hawaii so that's my older brother there in the picture but it's not just about family we also need to have friends that we can do things with that can help us and be there when we need things and even pets um, there's some interesting research that shows the value of having a pet for our um, mental health uh, a dog or a cat can help improve our emotions and decrease our stress so let's talk about what makes a relationship positive. What are the characteristics of healthy, positive relationships? Right. So one characteristic of healthy relationships is mutual respect. Right. So you, in in order for the relationship to be beneficial, really you have to start from a place of respecting each other. Um, and part of that is related to trust. Right. So you need to feel like you can count on that other person, that they respect your feelings, they respect your ideas, and they value you as a person. You also need to make sure that both people kind of have a sense of faith in each other and a sense of trust. And I'm not talking about just in um, romantic relationships. I'm just talking about in general, this can be true of friendships, of family relationships. I mean, you need to have trust in the other person's ability to make good, good decisions, to be there for you when you need them. Um, just in general, um, that each person trusts the other one um, is really critical to having a positive relationship. If one person in the relationship is really suspicious, um, is perhaps jealous a lot. And again, this could be in friendships too, not just romantic relationships. Um, they might be controlling. Um, they don't want you to go out and do things with other people because they don't trust you. Even parents, this is true of parents sometimes. Maybe they're overly controlling. They don't trust your ability to make good choices. Um, so they become overly involved in your lives. And that is unhelpful. Um, really positive relationships are based on mutual respect and trust um, and also empathy. Um, empathy, if you're not familiar with that word in English, because I know this is a chai chat, so we have varying levels of English, but empathy basically means your ability to sense other people's emotions, sort of feel what they're feeling, to understand what they're feeling, right? So healthy relationships, both people have empathy, are able to understand the other person's emotions and respect their emotions and respond in a kind and caring way um, to those emotions. All right, so respect, trust, empathy, communication. Most research puts communication as the number one variable in healthy relationships. The ability to clearly talk to each other, to communicate in a clear and effective way about how you're feeling, what you need, what you want from the relationship, and in general, just being able to like have conversations about things. Um, that's really important to positive relationships. So if you find that you're in a relationship and communicating is just a struggle. It's really hard to talk to that person and you have a lot of misunderstandings or you're just not able to clearly like express yourself or the other person is not able to express themselves. Um, that's a sign that things are not well, are not good in the relationship. Um, and you need to work on those communication issues. And then finally, enjoyment. Like <laughs> You should genuinely enjoy spending time with that person. If it's a positive relationship, more more often than not, you're going to feel better after spending time with them, right? It's not like there can't be difficult times. And um, of course, in any relationship, there's going to be disagreements, frustrations, you're going to get irritated with people. It's all part of being human. But on balance, more often than not, you actually feel better when you're with them or when you're spending time with them. If you spend time with somebody and you end up feeling exhausted afterwards, you're tired <laughs> and you like feel better when you get away from them, that's a sign that there, again, is something off about that relationship. 
And you really want to do your best to build yourself a network, a support system of people around you that have that you have positive relationships with. So the more that you can develop these relationships and really nurture them, the happier you'll be. So, I mean, think about that. Sometimes we don't have the choice of people we interact with. We have coworkers, we have family, and we don't get to pick those people. Um, but the more you can minimize your interactions with people who leave you feeling um, stressed, anxious, sad, tired, frustrated, the more you can minimize that and maximize your interaction with people who help you feel happy, content, peaceful, excited about life, the, the better it will be for you from a psychological perspective. So before I move on to the next one, this is probably a good time to also ask if there are questions because I, I thought that there might be some questions about the relationships. Usually, usually students want to talk about relationships. Um, so there is one interesting question. It's not about relationships, but mm -hmm. very close to what you were describing, uh, talking about. Um, question from Isis Beck. He's asking to find yourself and discover your talent one has to do what he or she is scared to do would yeah. you agree with this statement i would um i not necessarily say exactly what you're scared to do but you absolutely have to not be afraid to try new things to go outside of your comfort zone to stretch and grow um and experience um things that you haven't experienced before. You absolutely have to do that. You can't let fear um, stop you from experiencing the world because then, yeah, Azizbek is exactly right. If you really want to find flow, discover meaning in your life, understand your own skills, talents, and values, you have to stretch yourself. And sometimes that means doing things you're, you're a little bit scared to do. You know, like I'm a really afraid of heights. Um, my friends know that. And uh, when I was in, it was Kiva, I think. Yes. When I was in Kiva, the friend I was with wanted to climb the minaret. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that sounds horrible. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> and the person didn't give me a choice. My friend just like grabbed, my, grabbed me and like, we're going you're going up there. I'm like, okay. So I like climbed up on my hands and knees, like walking through my own breathing exercise. Like I was my own therapist. But you know, by the time I got up to the top, it was so beautiful. Like the view from the top of the minaret was amazing. And I'm like, I would have really missed out on something special if I had been like, if I had let my fear, well, if my friend actually had <laughs> let my fear keep me from doing that. Um, so, yeah, you absolutely have to push yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, I, I don't think I need to go skydiving in order to experience like my talents. But, um, yeah, push push the edges a little bit. Absolutely. And thank you for that question, Aziz Beck. Mm -hmm. And another question from Tamila. Oh, Tamila. Yeah. Have you ever met someone who doesn't want to think <laughs> positively and... <laughs> It's his comfortable, enjoyable position. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. What I do, do you do with, when you meet people like this? Do you like try to keep away from them or improve them? Yeah, it's okay. It's really hard. I do know people like this. In fact, I have family like this. So if I, two different answers to this question, depending on who it is. If I meet people, like newly meet people and they they seem like they're that kind of person who just really is stuck on a negative mindset. They just don't want to think positively or or try to improve their happiness or be in general like a happier person. Um, usually I don't really want to interact with them. You know, I'd be like, okay, I don't I don't need to add you to my circle of friends. <laughs> Thank you. It was nice meeting you and I'm moving on. Um, but if it's family, like, you know, you can't just really say no, thank you. Um, and I do have some family that are like this, and it's really difficult. Um, if, at some point, I, I mean, for a long time, I have tried to kind of like 
share my knowledge. Like, hey, why don't you try this? Why don't you do this with me? Let's go try yoga or exercise or meditation or in small ways trying to model this kind of behavior and trying to get them to see that people enjoy being around happy people more than they enjoy being around people who are constantly seeing the bad in life and are always negative. So I try that. And in some cases, it's it's kind of pushed the needle a little bit. But then there are other people in my life that I just, I just know, like, you're not going to change. And I have to just kind of back up and say, this is who you are. You are family. And I will, you know, do my best, but I also am not going to choose to spend extra time <laughs> with you because it's very draining to be around somebody who's constantly negative. Like it's hard to spend a lot of time with somebody who's always seeing the bad in things and focused on the negative and still maintain a positive attitude. Like it's, it, it's hard for us to do that. So yeah, I try to like put a box around it and be like, okay, <laughs> your family and I will do this with you, but I'm not going to spend all day every day, like interacting with you. Cause it's, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, at some point people have to make their own choices. You can't force somebody to be happy. <laughs> just like, it doesn't work. Um, so at that point you just have to make some choices of your own and say, I'm not going to spend that much time around you if you're going to be so unhappy. Yeah. So yeah, that was a good question to Mila. <laughs> Um, and one more question. Um, it's Ruslan. He's asking which relationship is more effective for positive relationships? I'm not sure what Ruslan you mean about which relationship. Um, I don't know if you're asking like which one of these five characteristics are most important or if you're asking no, like, good. yeah. So research tends to agree that communication is the number one factor. But really, for for a relationship to be healthy and constructive and, and positive for both parties, you need all five of these. So communication might be the most important, but, you know, effective communication is built on trust. Like if somebody's lying, then the communication is, is going to break down, right? If somebody is rude and disrespectful, the communication is going to break down, right? So they're all interconnected. Um, but communication is definitely one of the most important things. Um, and we need to have, uh, the other thing I didn't, I wasn't sure is if he was wondering if that's like parents or friends or uh, mm. a spouse or children or whatever, which one's most important to be happy. And I would say that we need them all. We need a variety of relationships because you can't have, well, I don't know if people know this expression in English, don't put your eggs in one basket. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to you don't want to count on one person to do everything f to support your mental health right so we need a variety of relationships we need friends we need family we need coworkers and colleagues that we enjoy um and many people feel like they need a romantic relationship too although you know there are plenty of people who go through life happy without ever getting married but still um, we need a variety because so we want to build a whole network around us of, of people that support our wellness and uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ruslan yeah. just um, said that he meant characteristics. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, of those five, it would be communication. Um, but again, as I said, they're they're really all interconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a question from Nilufar. Uh, she says that she's a kind of a person whose mind is always full of pessimistic thoughts. Mm -hmm. I'm not able to get rid of them easily. What to do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, optimism, the ability to think positively, can be a learned skill. Some people come by it naturally, but some people like Nilufar don't. So we have to train ourselves to think more optimistically. Um, one simple way to start is with a gratitude practice, noticing great things to be grateful for each day. Um, that can help shift your focus on the positive things in life. Um, and another thing to do just as a starting point is try to notice when you're being negative, when you're being pessimistic, actually to, to sort of cultivate this self-awareness and say to yourself, wow, 
I'm really stuck in a negative cycle right now. Like I'm thinking of all the bad things and then intervene, like stop yourself and purposely try to think of something positive, right? So refocus your brain on something positive. Those are the two easiest way to start. And it, it's, it can be a long practice of retraining your way of thinking because depending on how old you are, I mean, you've been thinking like a pessimist for a long time, many years. So don't expect it to change overnight. But with repeated practice, you can slowly shift your focus to being more optimistic. And there's whole classes on how to be become an optimist. So I give you the like 30 second overview. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Your student, um, Sukhrop, says that a couple of months ago you gave a lecture at yeah. his, um, JSI University. And um, he's very happy that you're sharing your thoughts. Oh, thank you. That's a wonderful gratitude note. I appreciate <laughs> that. Yeah. Uh, Delora is asking, how can parents strengthen positive relationships with children? Uh, that is a great great question. And I'm going to go back to which characteristic is most important, and that's communication, right? So anything parents can do to establish clear, open, sort of healthy communication with their kids, um, it's going to build more positive relationships. So if your children feel like they can talk to you and talk to you without being judged or criticized or otherwise like made to feel like they can't share things. Like sometimes parents will respond in a way that makes a child say, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Like, <laughs> I think you can all think of an example um, of things you probably wouldn't talk to your parents about right? because your parents wouldn't take it well. But the more, the more that you can have open channels of communication with your children and support them instead of judging them, the more they'll come to you and that will strengthen the relationship and that will help with respect and trust. And if you can empathize with them instead of judging them, um, really say, oh, I, you know, I understand how you're feeling. Or even if you don't understand, you can at least say, it, it looks like you're really upset about this. Tell me about it, right? Without judging them. Um, that's going to lead to much healthier relationships. Um, and long-term relationships, right? Because you want your children, I'm a mom, you, you saw the picture of my family. My son is now 17 and I am so happy that he still constantly talks to me. <laughs> like, and sometimes he talks to me about things I could care less about, but I try to pay attention and sort of validate him because I want him to come talk to me about the really important things. Right. So he tells me about his video games and it's like my eyes glaze over and I can hardly focus. I'm like, oh, I don't want to hear about more video games. But you know what? I want you to know that I'm here to listen to you no matter what it is. Um, so he'll talk to me about the more important things. At least that's my that's my strategy. Yeah. So that's what I would focus mm -hmm. on. Listening without judgment. I think if you do only one thing, that will help. Wow, this is amazing advice. <laughs> uh, I think... We don't have any questions so far, so we'll um, let you continue with your presentation. Great, because I have two more uh, things to mention, um, and then we'll just have time for, a little time for questions. So the M stands for meaning. It's important to feel like our life has purpose. So this is something that a lot of people struggle with, especially when they're younger. Like, what am I going to do with myself? What What is my purpose in life? Um, and one of the first things I tell students is to try new things. Like Aziz Beck said, you have to push yourself out of your comfort zone. Don't let fear of failure, fear of change, fear of trying something new keep you stuck in place because you really have to be able to experiment, to test out things, to try different things, to really find what you love, what you value, um, and where you want to spend your time. So think about your values, identify what's important to you, what's meaningful to you, and then start to get involved somehow in causes you believe in, organizations that support that kind of work, whether it's volunteering or finding a job or just um, participating in things like this, you know, maybe you're interested in diplomacy. And so 
you participate in embassy uh, workshops that they give, whatever it is, start trying to identify and trying out new things and getting involved so that you can connect with something bigger than yourself. Right? In order to feel a sense of meaning and purpose, we don't necessarily have to be religious. It's not about practicing religion, although many people find meaning from that. Um, it's just about connecting to something bigger than ourselves, some larger purpose, some, some sense that what you do impacts the world. It matters in some some small way at least. Um, and I put a picture of myself teaching. This was um, at a lyceum in Tashkent, actually. I was trying to remember which school I was in, but it was at a lyceum connected to the pedagogical university. And um, I'm very fortunate that I fairly early in life figured out what I love doing. And I get a great deal of satisfaction from teaching and I feel like it has meaning especially when I can come to other countries like Uzbekistan and interact with people in a way it feels very meaningful to do like this chai chat right and talk about how can parents build better relationships with their children if I even help one parent listen without judgment to their child so that their child feels more comfortable talking to their parent then that's meaningful. Like I've accomplished something, right? So you need to try different things, get involved, get outside of your comfort zone and, and, and see where do you find that feeling of purpose and meaning, right? Because again, if you can do that and do it in a way that incorporates a career even better, like that's really what you need um, to have like a, a career that you love. Like I love my job. Um, I, I don't ever want to like retire and stop working because I love what I do. Um, finally is the A in PERMA, a sense of achievement. Right? So we not only need to feel like what we do matters, but we need to feel like we can achieve things, that we have successes in our lives. And it's not just about the success, right? The actual achievement. It's about the journey there. It's, it's, it's the, the process of achieving that goal. So in order to have more sense of achievement, and this is something that parents and teachers can help their children or students with, is learning how to set realistic goals, right? Knowing what is reasonable to expect. Set a goal that challenges us, but challenges us in a way that encourages us to work a little harder, to stretch ourselves, but is still attainable, right? You don't want to set a goal. You don't want to say like, well, in the next five years, I want to um, own my own chain of restaurants around Tashkent and, and be a millionaire. Like, you know, that's not very realistic. <laughs> but you could set a goal of, you know, okay, I want to learn these skills associated with running a business and I want to apply for a small grant and maybe open up a little cafe somewhere, you know, in a park or something. Like, you know, realistic goals or long-term goals versus short-term goals. We can set short-term goals and say, you know, I want to apply for um, five different graduate programs in the U.S. or I want to apply for the Fulbright um, program through the embassy or what, whatever it is. So set realistic goals. Focus on things that have meaning to you, goals that you will really feel good about accomplishing and celebrate your successes. So when you do achieve a goal, don't be afraid to tell people about it, to celebrate, to go out with your friends or your family members and, you know, make a big deal out of it. Um, and when you do fail, because you will, a failure is inevitable. Nobody can exceed at everything all the time. You'll make mistakes. Things won't work out. You won't reach your goals. It's fine. That's part of life. It's part of the process. It's part of being human. But don't let that stop you from making forward progress. Reflect on it. Think, okay, what did I do? What could I possibly do differently next time? So that you can learn from that experience um, and adjust your behavior, your approach, whatever it is, so that you're more successful in the future. So that's PERMA. Um, if you want to be a happier person, here's the summary. Be grateful. Enjoy the moment that you're in. Find flow in your lives. 
find meaning in what you do, build positive relationships, and set goals and accomplish them. Right? Those are the keys overall to living a happy, healthy life. So that is the formal presentation. There's my contact info if people um, want to send me an email or you want to follow me on Instagram. And then I'm happy to take any remaining questions that people have. Thank you so much, Lori. Absolutely. This was amazing. Um, we have some more questions. Great. So Rob is asking how to start a meaningful conversation with a person you don't know about in order to build a close relationship? That's a really good question. Um, the best approach in my experience is to ask the person about themselves. Most people enjoy talking about themselves. So if you can ask some questions to draw them out and then learn more about them, um, you can start to build a meaningful conversation and look for ways that you can connect with them, right? So ask them about themselves, ask them what they like, ask them what they do, um, and then uh, try to find commonalities. So then you can follow up on those topics, right? So if they say they love, I don't know, K-pop music, you can say, you know what? I really like K-pop too. What's your favorite song? You know, and then you, you build connections that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question coming from our um, telegram. Um, when you practice meditation, does it help to prevent you from COVID-19? Okay, so here's how I would answer that question. So it's not going to directly prevent you from getting exposed to COVID-19, right? I mean, the germs are out there. Um, but what happens when you practice meditation, mindfulness, or any other kinds of stress reduction techniques, whatever it works for you to relax, um, that boosts your immune system. Because when you're, when you're under stress, there's a physiological process that happens in your body. And part of the stress hormones that are released they sort of have a side effect of suppressing the immune system. So when you're under stress, you can't fight off germs effectively, which is why people get sick when they have like big stressful events coming up. Maybe you're a student and right before the, the exams at the end of the year or right before you take your IELTS or right before your wedding, maybe when you're really stressed, you're going to get sick because that stress suppresses your immune system. So if you can meditate, if you can practice mindfulness, exercise, um, whatever sort of techniques work for you to relax and reduce your stress, that's going to improve your immune system. So your body's going to naturally be able to fight off germs more effectively. And that includes COVID-19 germs, right? So if you can keep yourself in a more relaxed state when you get exposed to COVID, hopefully, it's less severe. You can fight it off more quickly. Um, I had COVID. I mean, I didn't know I had COVID. I happened to get tested because I was exposed and I was positive, but I had no symptoms. So I'm one of those lucky people. And I don't know if it's because I was sort of managing my stress or I just genetically won the lottery and I don't get mm -hmm. COVID symptoms. I don't know. Um, but definitely um, it helps boost your immune system. Anything you can do to relax and reduce your stress. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Lori. Absolutely. We have so many people saying you thank you for <laughs> your presentation, saying that it was wonderful and amazing. Oh, and uh, Sokrop is asking, do you plan to come to Uzbekistan again <laughs> in, in the future? Well, God willing, I will have an opportunity to come back. So I would, I would love it. At the current moment, I am between projects and I'm just kind of waiting to hear if I have an opportunity to come back to Uzbekistan in maybe the fall, I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. um, as, hoping that you guys don't go back on a lockdown too with COVID cases spiking, so. We're keeping our right. fingers crossed. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So yeah, maybe with, with some luck, I'll be able to come back and do a chai chat in person in the fall. We hope so. We hope so. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Professor Wolf. Uh, you, you've been a motivator for us today and uh, you gave so much wonderful, helpful advice. And um, I, I think it will help all of us to live a happy and healthy life. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk with you. And thank you to everyone who watched and asked questions. I really appreciated you, uh, your attentiveness as an audience. Yeah, it was a great audience. Thank you for wonderful yeah. questions. And for everyone else, join us next Friday um, for another talk. All Thanks right. so much, Laurie. Thank you. Bye. Day. You Bye -bye. too. Good night. Good night.